Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with head strength and conditioning coach at the LA Galaxy, Daniel Guzman. This episode of the Pacey Performance Podcast is sponsored by Valve Performance, the team behind the Nordboard hamstring testing system. So the Nordboard is the fastest and easiest and most accurate way to measure hamstring strength in under 90 seconds. So the Nordboard gives you the right information so you can make the right decisions for your players at the right time. So it's already in use by over half the Premier League uh, and dozens of other elite teams around the world. Uh, so the Nordboard testing system is the is on its way to becoming the gold standard for measuring and monitoring hamstring strength. So if you are interested in getting to know anything more about the Nordboard, you can visit Vald Performance, that's V-A-L-D performance.com to find out more. This episode of the Pacey Performance Podcast is sponsored by Train With Push, creators of the Push Band. So the Push Band is the first scientifically validated uh, wearable device to provide Objective insights into your performance in the gym. So using accelerometers and a gyroscope, the push band is able to use bar speed to regulate load and volume based on your ability in the gym on any given day. So you can use the push band to quickly establish uh, one RMs with submaximal load so you can plan with confidence. So the push band portal also allows you to create programs before entering the gym. Uh, to make change on the fly depending on how you are performing on that given day. So you can customize everything from target velocity ranges to differentiating velocities for warm up and creating working sets and supersets uh, for yourself or your athletes. So if you do want to know more about Train With Push and the Push Band, get yourself over to trainwithpush.com. They also got a great blog so you can catch up with some guest bloggers such as Mladen Ivanovic and Dan Baker. So be sure to check them out at trainwithpush.com. Thanks for tuning in to episode 78 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. Uh, So today we have Dan Guzman coming to us from LA. So Dan's the Head of Strength and Conditioning uh, at the LA Galaxy. So it was obviously a really interesting story with the Galaxy and how how Dan's kind of risen through the ranks, uh, working with the Academy and, and Galaxy 2, and then obviously the Galaxy First team. Um, so with such big names, we obviously uh, discussed the, the culture, uh, which has been driven by Dan and a couple of his colleagues at, at the Galaxy, um, as well as uh, kind of education uh, for players and coaches, uh, which is really, really interesting. So thanks for tuning in to episode 78. Again, would love your feedback uh, on how the kind of the podcast can get better um, anything that needs to change uh, or any guests that you'd like to see or hear from uh, over the next couple of months so enjoy the chat with Dan and I'll speak to you soon Hi guys thanks for tuning in to the Pacey Performance Podcast so today we've got uh, Dan Guzman coming from LA so welcome to the podcast Dan Thanks Rob thanks for having me excited to Get chatting up. Absolute pleasure, mate. So, do you just want to give us a, a little rundown and an introduction on you, yourself and, and what you're currently doing? Yeah, sure. So, this is my uh, third season with the LA Galaxy. Um, I'm currently head strength and conditioning coach. And um, right now, my main role is to work with the first team with their, uh, their strength, power, uh, work in the gym, and then the movement stuff and the uh, uh, ESD fitness that we do on the field. Um, I also oversee two other strength coaches we have in the club, uh, one with our Galaxy 2, which is like our second division, and then another guy with our academy who uh, oversees the 18s and the 16s. Mm-hmm. You just want to give us a little bit of a info on um, on the kind of structure of the club? I know it might have changed recently. Yeah, sure. So uh, originally we had just the uh, LA Galaxy first team, 25 to 30 players. Um, and we've kind of expanded with uh, the LA Galaxy 2, and they play in what's called the USL uh, League, and that's kind of our second division. And um, 
it's almost like our farm team or our U23 team. And a bunch of teams around the league are now adopting this and they're having their second team. Um, and it's a good place for our players to kind of go up and down the ranks as they kind of move up and develop. Uh, we also have um, our LA Galaxy Academy. And in the past, um, kind of how it is around the United States, that was just a separate team that was affiliated with the club. Uh, but the way we have it here is we have a full-time school here, uh, a high school with the U18 and the U16. And so the kids are here all day. Um, and it's been a great experience to help uh, kind of educate them and uh, lead them in their uh, performance protocols and their physical development and their tactical development um, with the club. And so uh, those kids are there from about 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. every day. And then our last small part is that we have uh, a bunch of youth academy teams, um, U14, U12, and down. Um, but they're not part of the school. They're just um, younger kids, still go to their own school, but come in on their own. So this may be slightly boring for the guys that kind of maybe from the US or are familiar with the system, but do you just want to give us a little bit of a, a kind of brief rundown on before all this kind of academy and Galaxy 2 uh, kind of came into play? Where were you getting your players from? Just to, do you just want to give us a little bit of a rundown on the system? Yeah, definitely. So the way the MLS works, um, it's like other American sports where there's the MLS draft. And so what that is, is that's kids from uh, mostly college who uh, will go into this draft and they do a series of uh, performance tests and um, they play a lot of 11 v 11 matches and you have scouts and coaches um, come watch over them and give their two cents and then play, players can be picked up from there. Um, I'd say where the bulk of our players are coming from with the LA Galaxy is uh, other countries or um, other teams. That's kind of what we're made up of. And so what happens is uh, when you come into the MLS and you become, let's say you're playing for LA Galaxy for us, the MLS controls uh, kind of your rights. And so to move around within the country or move out of the country, the MLS will kind of control that. Um, so it's kind of an interesting setup. Uh, we also have what's called a designated player or a DP. And these are players that are... Uh, um, much above the uh, salary cap and uh, you can have up to three on your team and I guess the teams can choose how they use that portion of their money to get you know, three big players or spread it out around the club. That's up for them. Uh, the way that we've done it in the past is um, gone after three big players from uh, across the country or sorry, out of the country international. Um, and the rest of our players are players who kind of been in the league uh, for a good amount of time. Um, and then obviously, then I guess the next step is as the Galaxy 2 and Academy have come around, we've started signing uh, more players from there. But that's the general makeup of our team at this point and where we came from in the past. So is that is that kind of wage structure public? Do people know who them three, uh, you know, it could be three, uh, guys that are earning more than everyone else? Yeah, I think okay. um, as the MLS has grown, they try and uh, really take advantage of kind of showing off who those guys are. And so people will know who's a DP, who's a designated player on each on each team. Um, and then they kind of almost franchise that player for their club um, unless they, you know, end up selling them. But, yeah, they really want the people to know this is our designated player. This is kind of where we're putting our value into and who's going to lead our club and, and so on from there. So were you, were you around the club when uh, Dave Beckham was there? No, so okay. I came the year after after he retired okay. uh, from the LA Galaxy. Okay. No, I was just interested. Um, nothing to do with anything. Uh, just do, I think one thing that I wanted to discuss with you was something that's obviously quite unique and something that I've not, well, I don't think anyone's had the chance to uh, to discuss who I've had on the podcast before, and that's kind of been involved with, with starting the academy. And... Obviously, the guys maybe over here have, have had academies for maybe a number of years and it's only reason to be established. But the, the process of that you kind of went through to or you helped with put things in place from a kind of physical point of view um, in, in the academy. Do you just want to talk to us through that process um, and yeah, putting that together? So, I mean, I first got to say this was not me by myself at all. Yeah. You know, I, I like to say that our academy and our Galaxy 2 
is uh, kind of kind of a value of the whole team we put together to make this process happen. I definitely couldn't do this on my own. Yeah, so uh, what we were trying to do with our Galaxy 2 and our Academy is to try and make um, a similar model that kind of represented what we did on the first team and what could be applied with the second team and the Academy. Now, at this point, we just had the Galaxy 2 and the first team, and um, we had to look at what kind of manpower do we have to make sure that we could actually run our systems. You know, I think if we had this elaborate elaborate uh, system that, uh, you know, the highest quality we could get, no matter what it was, if we didn't have uh, the right staff in place to run it, then it didn't matter how great the system was. So we wanted to start very simple and, and kind of have a, a, a very vulnerable conversation and say, hey, what can we actually carry out day to day? What can be consistent and what can give players the best product? And so we looked at, um, with our Galaxy 2, our warm-ups, our strength sessions, our movement sessions, our uh, recovery strategies, and our data analytics program. And we kind of built it up from there. Um, it was kind of a cool way to kind of see how this was forming it out, to kind of compare with the first team or the second team um, where the benefits were at. And so we noticed real quick, which uh, I'm sure with clubs that have, you know, a full U team kind of developed, you kind of notice that, uh, the younger they are, obviously, more development, more education is needed. That a lot of these kids, from where we were getting them at, they'd kind of been bouncing around from team to team, or they just come out of a college program. So there's so many different uh, ideals and beliefs of what's the best way to get me fit for a match, what's the best way to have me feeling my best when I play 90 minutes. And so when you're starting out in this brand new team, like I said, it's you're not getting a whole lot of backlash. Players are trying to make the squad. They want to impress the manager, want to impress the staff. And so we can really throw in a lot of education there and uh, put a lot of responsibility on the players to say, hey, this is what we're about and this is what we want to kind of help you guys achieve your goals uh, by taking this direction. Um, one thing I'll kind of sit on a little bit is our data analytics. If we look at our um, data analytics uh, performance plan and how we kind of want to develop that from each club or from uh, each portion of our club. The first team we were using the Adidas My Coach, and uh, it was actually it was a great experience using that um, to get a lot of quality information. Obviously, if you want to get even better, you could get you know a Mojo system or something where um, you got all the cameras set up. But with the LA Galaxy Two, it was a different financial situation. And so we purchased uh, polar heart rate monitors. And that was our main, um, I guess you would say, data analytics makeup of what our program was. And so we would use that um, each day to kind of monitor the players' loads and give the manager feedback on uh, how his training session went. Now from there, he'd want to look at certain drills. And as best as we could, we would break up those drills and kind of catalog them to see, okay, when you do 5v5, this is kind of where the heart rate volume's at when you do 77, 11 v 11, and so on. Um, that way we can kind of create a recipe for what the coach wants. And so as we kind of, um, you know, I'll use the big, or the periodization, or really what is just a plan. As we plan with the manager and create that relationship, um, it helps him to learn, okay, when I run this session, I'm running two days uh, pre-match, my heart rate load should be at X amount on average for most of the players. Obviously, there will be some players that are much higher or much lower depending on um, different factors, but I think it was helpful to give the manager some sort of feedback on what his training session was intensity-wise and then uh, give him a measure of a total week, what his weekly loads were like. Um, from there, another big thing that we did was uh, our recovery strategies and um, – I guess I'll kind of build into our academy as well, what we do with them. Um, we kind of built in um, our internal load and our questionnaires. And so we got um, a subjective RPE that we get after each session. And then we use uh, a TQR, what's uh, called a total quality recovery. And all it is, it's a survey that looks at different aspects of sleep, nutrition, um, emotional status, and Every player has their own sheet, and what happens is um, they begin to get a score, and we have the score from 6 out of 20 on their TQR, 
And there's various points. And for example, if, if you ate dinner that night, you got a few points. And if you had a snack before you're going to go out to train, you got a point. And so when it looked at uh, nutrition and sleep and tissue quality, for example, Rob, if you had a high training session, and let's say we asked you to rate your session on a scale of 6 to 20, 20 being the hardest, 6 being very easy. And you had a session that was 19, almost maxed out. It was a really tough session for you. We'd want to see that your TQR, or your recovery uh, survey, was matching that or showing that you're putting the work to recover. And so as athletes, we get competitive. And what happened is if these guys in the beginning would learn, oh, I didn't take a nap today, I skipped lunch, and I skipped dinner. Okay, well, I only got 10 points, but my RPE tells me that that session was a 19 for me. That was really tough. And so that was an opportunity for us to educate the players and, and work with them every single day and show them, look, if you would have fit in another meal at lunch and you would have got a, a pregame snack, just there alone, your score would have been at a 14, which would have been much higher. And so then it was cool to see them start to challenge themselves and, you know, they answered games to each other. Like, oh, I recovered at a 17, you recovered at a, a 9. And, and within, um, <clears throat> I'd say, a month or so, we saw drastic results in their TQR, that the recovery scores were going right up. And it was helping to enforce uh, the recovery strategies that we wanted to put in place with the players. And so when we talk about sleep quality, not just sleep quantity, and we talk about um, man emotional stress and how to make good decisions nutritionally, we can all relate it back to their TQR so that every day they can compete with each other and, and get a high score. Now for us on the staff side, um, our academy doesn't have any sort of GPS system or um, heart rate monitoring system. All we have is um, our RPEs and our TQRs. And, and so as much as I think as with all data, we just want to use it to complement what we're doing. Um, our academy coaches kind of lived on that a little bit more. But it's really been helpful for him to educate um, his coaches. As with their group, it's just one fitness coach and two academy coaches. And he's been able to work with them and say, look, today we're looking to get a, a, a step in RPE from all the players. Um, with that, we're going to have a high session. We got to make sure we spend time um, and the cold tub, hot tub, um, find a way if we can get these guys uh, a nap during the day before their second session. And so the coaches start to buy into. And it helps overall education with our academy and with our second team that not just the players are learning, but the coaches are learning as well. And so it's helped to develop our culture and uh, really kind of define what we're moving for in our performance program. Now, if you're at one of the top clubs in the world, and you tell them, we're not going to use any sort of GPS monitoring system. We're just going to use questionnaires and a survey. They'd probably look at you and laugh. And I would say, yeah, you got to do better than that. But with the, the financial situation we were in and uh, starting kind of ground up, it was a great opportunity uh, to really value the players' um, internal load and kind of how they felt and, and use it actually as an opportunity to educate them. Um, and it's been really cool to kind of see that development. And I'd say that's just a small piece of how we've used um, our academy and our Galaxy 2 to pour in a lot of our education and kind of grow that. So when they get to the first team and you have your stats sports and your Omega Wave um, and a simple questionnaire, it's all something that they're used to. It's not like we're putting extra work on them. And, and they already know, oh, when I have a tough session two days post-match or three days post-match, that I know what my recovery strategies are. And they start bringing in the younger guys. And I think in a few years, we'll start to see uh, the benefits of this as we keep on continuing to grow it, um, eventually get um, some sort of GPS for our academy. Um, but the biggest thing is that we want consistency through and through from the first team to the second team to the academy. Um, if I send a guy up uh, or send a guy down from the first team to the second team, and train for the day, I can give my fitness coach a card and say, hey, here was his um, his load from the past two days. His uh, subjective questionnaire showed this, look out for A, B, and C, and then in a strength program, we'll adjust here. And um, yeah, like I said, we like to run lean and mean. We got a small staff, but for us, communication is the biggest thing. And uh, I think the more we can communicate and I guess kind of be on the same page with all of our players from top to bottom as they move up and down. It makes it a lot easier on the managers and when they're trying to set up their training sessions. And as a performance staff, um, things kind of run smooth. And we like to say we're the man behind the man behind the man. 
um, we don't need to be in the spotlight. And so it, it makes our players look good and we get a lot of respect to them. So it's been a cool experience uh, for our club as a whole, I would say. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very interesting. So one thing that kind of interests me is that is that kind of culture that comes down, like you say, from the first team and, and how that would maybe be affected should the manager change or should the the kind of philosophy change um, because of movement of certain staff? Do you have a, a kind of a club ethos, a club kind of culture which stays the same in the academy in Galaxy 2 that is kind of removed from that, that politics at the, at the front end? Or is that... Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or is that kind of yeah, filtered yeah. down? So if there was a change, would kind of everyone change? If that makes sense? Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, here with the first team, our manager's been here um, for a good amount of time, okay. longer than I've been here. And so obviously that's made things easier when we're trying to input these strategies and um, I guess kind of make that consistency through and through. Um, so knowing that, that, you know, if there's a manager change and they could change everything and say, you know, we don't want to use GPS at all. I'm just not for it. You know, if a manager said that, uh, I guess kind of what we're building towards is that if we can make our performance pro program so strong, so consistent, I guess, so trustworthy, um, that when a new manager comes in and we say, Hey, look, this is what we got going on. What do you think about, um, everything that that's going on here? You trust this. Um, that'll kind of sell itself. Now, if there is a change, I think a lot of things would change maybe with the club philosophy. Um, I think our performance program is pretty stable and what we got going on now. And even from manager to manager, first team academy, uh, second team, there's obviously uh, different views and how they're going to bring up their teams in, the, in small ways. But uh, so far, it's been pretty good to, I guess, kind of, work with uh, the different managers at each level and kind of show them, hey, our goal is to move your players up from stage to stage. And if and if we stay consistent with what's going on from top to bottom, they'll be bought in. I think uh, this is kind of off topic, but something that's actually helped out as well is uh, I'll do uh, strength sessions for our coaches and kind of take them through our education of what our performance program is. So instead of our coaches just seeing that um, this is what, you know, player A is doing, player B, player C. I've kind of asked them, hey, are you willing to kind of go through it a bit and, nice. and train a little bit? And they've jumped on board. And so we've taken them through full uh, recovery education, you know, after a hard session, what are we trying to do? Uh, their movement quality in the gym, you know, and that's simple stuff. They're not trying to play 90-minute matches, but if we're telling them, look, You've got uh, hip mobility issues here, and I notice you have back pain because you're sitting most of the day editing film, that kind of stuff. And it's been really cool because the group started out with just one guy, and now we have uh, five, seven, eight coaches sometimes training at different times, and they're kind of pulling each other in, but it helps with the buy-in because it, let's say we're having uh, trouble with, you know, one of our midfielders doesn't really want to do his stuff in the gym, doesn't want to do his correctives. Well, now a coach in his own meeting who says, hey, look, uh, I know this stuff is important. It's going to help you out here and here. I've been there. I'm doing the program now. You know, this is what's going to help you out. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that we're giving our, our uh, managers and our coaches uh, the same performance program we're giving our athletes. <laughs> but the fact that they've been going through this education um, um, and actually get to experience it, it helps so much with the buy-in and what we're doing. Um, and it's, it's developed a lot of cool conversations that have come out of it. Um, and now there's a little bit of banter there too with the players and with the staff. Oh, have you done your workout today? Once the coach training, uh, it's been pretty cool to see from that that end. Mm. I like that. It's cool that. Um, so just just moving on slightly, um, something that we kind of discussed uh, a little bit more informally uh, before we uh, before we hit record, and that was and that was you working with with players with um, mixed training ages coming from different parts of the world. Some people that have kind of won Champions Leagues and, you know, d been exposed to certain members of staff who have got certain philosophies and now they're like any club, I suppose, but even more, it seems, in the MLS where it's, it's you know, it's reasonably new and people are kind of coming from all different parts of the world with, with such a, a variety of kind of playing experience. How is that, how, from a performance point of view, how are you kind of mingling that together? 
um, and, and and putting these guys in the you know under the same philosophy and the same and the same roof. Yeah, sure. So uh, obviously, we get a a lot of big name international players come to LA Galaxy, uh, which it's great for our team, great for the club. Um, but it's definitely a challenge because you'll have guys from different parts of the world, like you said. Um, they've had much different experiences, the way that their staff is. Um, but what's been really good to see is that uh, these players that are coming from overseas, um, super respectful, uh, super on board, and, and they understand they're going to the club, there's going to be a new philosophy. Uh, I'm kind of kind of just got to jump on board. Now, that being said, uh, I've tried to take a very straightforward approach with them and try and, I guess, meet them man to man and say, look, You've been doing this for the next amount of years. You've been successful with that. Why don't you show me some stuff that you like to do? I'll show you stuff that I think is important for you um, in the gym, before going to training, fitness stuff, and we'll kind of work through it together and we'll build there. Now, of course, there's going to be some stuff that could be questionable, um, maybe that I don't believe in, but I think by allowing them to do it at first and kind of showing them, hey, I'm going to do this with you. I'm going to, why don't you take me through your core routine? Why don't you take me through... Uh, one type of fitness you like and the next three days you do my type of fitness and so that's helped a lot because then the players are are able to trust a little bit more and see okay I, I kind of like what's going on here um, I'm still doing my own routine I have my own routine but we'll add in one of your stuff and so over time as the relationship develops I think trust is such a big thing if you can get your your uh, athlete to trust you then they'll start to buy in with anything and so what we see is that um, they'll have their own routines. Let's say we're talking about the gym, for example. Um, player A likes to do uh, his core work on one day and his lower lower body power on another day and upper upper body two days pre-match. And so, so um, every week I'll throw in, hey, why don't we try one of my things and then you can do a few of your things. Why don't you try two of my things? You know, and we start to build it in. Before we know it, a month's gone by. And it's their routine, but now they're doing everything that, as a LA Galaxy performance, <laughs> want uh, them to do. And it's been really helpful. And they kind of know their bodies, but they trust us. Like, hey, you're the boss. Whatever you say, uh, I'll go, but just explain it to me. Um, talk me through kind of what we're doing and why we're doing it. What's the why? And I think uh, to kind of turn it back on the athlete, I'll kind of say, hey, well, what's your goal? You know, you're coming over, you're 32 years old. You know, we expect you to play 90 minutes. What is your goal this season? And so by putting some responsibility on them and kind of putting their mindset in a frame, okay, what do I really want to achieve here? We get a lot better buy-in. So when we're doing an exercise and they say, hey, I really like to do this, and I can say, okay, you like, for example, let's say it's step-ups. I like to do step-ups for my lower body strength. I say, okay, step-ups, is this in your whole plan, what you're doing? Is this going to help you achieve your goal? Yes, okay, let's do it. No, okay, maybe we should think about something else. And so that way we can kind of always relate back to their mindset of what is my ultimate goal here? You know, is my goal to play 90 minutes? Is my goal that I'm a, um, a super sub coming off the bench? Whatever that is. And that approach has worked well for a lot of players. Um, now, obviously, that's a lot of our older players. Our younger players, um, it might just be the American culture, or a testament to the staff we have here. That love being in the gym. Uh, they love doing their movement skill on the field. Um, they're kind of always looking for a way to get better. And so that's been really encouraging. And it's been helpful to kind of carry out plans with them because um, there's not a whole lot of questions asked. They just kind of jump on board and, okay, coach, that's what you said. Let's do it. I actually challenge them more to ask questions and say, hey, well, you can ask me, why am I doing this? You know, we're, we're doing um, sled pushes today. Well, why are we doing that? Why is it going to help out? That way, you know, if they go to another team or they work with someone in the off season, um, they kind of know what the makeup of their plan is. And so the younger guys, I'll challenge them to ask why. Always ask why. What's going on? I tell them they can ask me any question they want all day about exercise A, B, and C, and, and we can go from there. But um, I think if we looked at the group collectively, Obviously, there's times where you have the younger guys and the older guys working out together. And the way we kind of do it here is um, week to week, guys kind of have the routines of when they like to work out. And so sometimes we have, you know, our oldest player working out with our youngest player. 
And I think we talked about this a little bit before is that um, there's a lot of good banter that goes on. You might have a, a kid fresh out of college from, from the U.S. and you have uh, someone from the U.K., for example, coming over. And so there's good banter there and they push each other along. And um, we like to obviously do a group training atmosphere. And these guys, they mix up their groups all the time. You know, and sometimes if there's backlash with the younger guys, I'll say, hey, well, the Liverpool captain's doing it. You know, <laughs> if the Liverpool captain can do it, I think you can do it. You know, and that's when they kind of come back. OK, I think you're right. You know, um, so it's it's been awesome. It's been good for the older guys to kind of take that leadership and, and bring along the younger guys and say, look, this is important. It's going to be a big part of your career. Um, as far as what we do with our older players, obviously things have to be managed differently. Um, the MLS requires a lot different travel uh, than some of our international guys are used to. And so uh, that definitely plays a role in what's going on. Um, our young guys might be able to train day after a match, or sorry, not train, jump in the gym day after a match if they played 90 minutes and break a sweat and get um, some of their lower body, lower body power work out of it. Um, where our, as our older guys, they might need a few more days to recover um, that's where you might be talking to the manager and saying, hey, look, I think um, so-and-so might need an extra day of a, a regeneration or regen day and um, make decisions from there. Um, but that being said, it's not always easy, you know, having different ages, different styles. Um, and a, a few years ago, we had a lot of different languages. And, you know, I, I understand a little bit of Spanish, but English is my main language. And so um, figuring out how to work with guys who – aren't all speaking the same language. You know, you have four different guys and one speaks English and one speaks Spanish, one speaks uh, French, you know, it's, it's definitely a challenge, but um, it's definitely doable. Um, I think the fact that we don't really force anything, we try and put it on the players and have them have that accountability. That's what works best with the galaxy in our atmosphere. Um, if you force too many things around here, you're not going to get the best buy And I think I'm sure you've seen that at different different places and, and uh, where you worked at. But that's kind of been my experience with the different ages amongst our team. Yeah, I mean, from a from a kind of English point of view, we don't get many, or we don't seem to have many players kind of exported from here. So to hear and, and yeah, to hear about how the English guys kind of cope with it in the US or, or elsewhere is really interesting. How have they, how have they kind of in, integrated with regards to the, the kind of strong, I suppose, lifting culture um, that you guys seem to have over there and pre, in, in football or soccer, we seem to be uh, slightly behind over here. How have they, how have they integrated with, um, with that kind of culture? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I think it's important to know that in our facility, we share the facility with um, uh, with EXOS, which used to be Athletes Performance, and so they have a bunch of athletes coming in, and it gets kind of nuts, but in, in our preseason, in end of January, February, is the same time that the NFL Combine prep is going on for the college it's coming out. And so obviously there's a lot of weights moving around, and, and um, a lot of loads lifted, and so our guys will walk in um, in the mornings when they're they're doing their uh, prehab or their correctives before they go out, and they're saying, saying, hey, Dan, can I push that much? Can I lift that much? <laughs> and I would say, hey, these guys, you know, it's a different sport, different stuff going on, but there's nothing wrong with pushing a little bit more weight. And so I think sometimes seeing that a whole lot more often when there's always guys in the gym, um, even though it's different athletes, it's kind of encouraging, you know. Some guys – they kind of get excited and they say, hey, I want to look like that with my shirt off. And I'm saying, okay, let's go back to your goal. Not make you <laughs> Put your shirt better. back on, Stevie. Put it back on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we we got to save the show for another day. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, that, that's been a, when one aspect that's helpful in a way to kind of show the guys that, look, these guys are playing at super high velocities. They're playing an impact sport and they're lifting a lot of weight and they're, and they're still able to go out and train, you know. Uh, so that's been good there. I think when our international guys come on over, it's what you would expect. They're not used to all the lifting. It's not the same. And obviously we're not, not forcing that. There's a lot more education going there. And for me, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're 18 years old or if you're 34 years old, we want to make sure movement quality, uh, is a priority of our program. And so 
I'll let the guys know, look, we're not going to crush your legs and make you lift a super high load before a training session. Why don't we do this? Have your session after the session, have a meal or before your meal, come find me. And then we'll do our separate session uh, with lighter loads and kind of build them into it. Um, I think, like I said before, with the different training ages and styles, you know, if I'm putting uh, one of our international guys with one of our young American kids who grew up doing a lot of school and in their college programs, uh, there's obviously a little bit of banter that goes there, but it almost makes the, the international guys feel safe. Like, okay, I can do this, you know. Now, I'm not going to lie. Of course, there's a lot of bicep curls and, and uh, you know, tricep work going on at the end because, <laughs> you know, it's America and we're in L.A. and guys want to look good on the beach. But, um, you know, it's, it's still good and these guys are starting to buy in. Um, I'd say it's pretty rare, though, that we have some guys that – will come over right away and, you know, they want to crush the leg weights, you know, a couple times after practice. We still have to have that education. There's still got to be the why if they're doing this. And that's where they're asking me, hey, is this going to help me on the field? You know, and that's where I can explain to them. And some guys, they want to see their GPS loads and their Omega Wave scores and see, is everything I'm doing help me on the pitch? Um, which has been a good challenge for me and my staff. But um, I would say overall, they are buying in. Um, Still, I think the American culture is a little more pushing the weights and, you know, they, they kind of want to get after it. But uh, the intensity is still there for the international guys. They have different stuff they like to do. And um, it kind of helps our culture all in all to teach each other about uh, different styles, different movements of what the players like to do. And they kind of bring each other along, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I just want to ask you one thing before I let you go. Um, Obviously, over here, the distances are considerably considerably shorter than what you're dealing with over there. You just want to give us a, yeah. kind of a brief overview of, obviously, you're going coast to coast if you play in kind of New York. You just want to give us the kind of maybe 12 hours, 24 hours pre-game and 12, 24 hours post-game and what that, what that looks like for a, a big, what is it, four, five, six-hour flight? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, flying in the MLS is a huge factor that cannot be overlooked. And I think especially being in L.A. where we are actually on, you know, as far of the West Coast as you can get, um, it makes it a little more difficult. But all teams got to fly around. So at least everyone's dealing with that challenge at some point. I would say um, things that we try and control as a club is – 24 hours before um, we look at where are we flying to you know are we flying to altitude what kind of weather are we flying to um, how do we need to change uh, the flight times of uh, to kind of match when these players are going to sleep and waking up you know you're only going to be there for 24 hours but uh, if you're flying over to the east coast and you get in at you know, 2 a.m., even though it's 8 a.m. our time, but you got to get, or sorry, uh, 8 o'clock. And, you know, there's so many things that can go on when it comes to times and stuff like that. I think we always try and stick back to the basics. And so um, a typical 24-hour pre-match for us is to leave, uh, train and travel, we'll train in the morning, 10 a.m., and then get to the flight as soon as we can after that. Um, if it's an coast trip, we usually go a day earlier. So we'll kind of go 48 hours before and then train the next day if we're going to New York, for example. Um, if we're staying somewhere on the West Coast or on the western side of the United States, we'll, we will uh, trade and travel that day and then have the match the next day. Uh, 12 hours for the match. Um, we pretty much uh, give the players their full schedule um, before they're on the flight so they know when their first meal is, when their lunch meal is, uh, training, so and so and so. Uh, depending on when the match is, for example, we're playing New York, uh, seven o'clock match their time. We'll pro we'll train at night uh, that day to try and get synced up with uh, their clock and uh, get our players, uh, I guess, kind of in that mindset, kind of in that that state before they get there. Um, that way, uh, the next day they can kind of wake up at what would be their normal routine for a, a game day. Um, when they wake up that morning, 
we'll try and do breakfast and then a team walk, depending on the weather. Uh, if you're in New York and it's <laughs> East Coast and it's snowing, it's a little bit more difficult. You know, some of our, our UK guys are saying, hey, this is fine. Let's go on. You know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> but obviously not everyone's on that same page. So um, we'll rent out the conference room and we'll do um, some sort of movement quality and tissue quality in there. Uh, bust out the foam rollers and the stretch ropes and the trigger points. Um, and then take them through a light warm up just to kind of get their bodies moving. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is uh, when you're in the hotels and you can't go outside because uh, of the weather, whatever the situation may be. Players tend to stay in their rooms a little too much, watching movies, staying in their beds and not moving a whole lot. So we really try and encourage that movement. Um, I'll set up a strength session uh, for guys that aren't in the 18 or that, are, that guys aren't in the starting 11. Um, and it's not a, a full-on strength session. It's more of a um, a core glute activation mobility kind of session. And then guys who are in the 11, if they want to do something after the walk uh, in the gym, same thing, just kind of a, a core activation, glute activation mobility session. Um, that way we just get them moving and they're not sitting around. I would say after the match, um, normally we always preach that sleep quality is the biggest thing. So we'll stay that night, um, have the players get up at a decent time, you know, 8 to 10, depending on when the flight's available, and then get home as soon as we can. Uh, after that, we'll have a regen day the following day, and then usually followed by a day off, depending on where we flew. I think uh, the biggest thing for us, and it all kind of ties back together with, with educating the coaches as well. If, if I go to the manager and tell them, hey, look, we need to do a regen session when we get back from the flight, um, we're going to do the following strategies. He's pretty much bought in, which is helpful. But, um, yeah, I think the biggest challenge I see is the sleep quality. I'm sure you know from when you played, if you play a 90-minute match and, uh, you, you know, it's nil-nil, you go an extra time and you, you score a game winner, I don't think you're going to be able to sleep within an hour <laughs> or two hours of that match. Yeah. You'll probably be wired up for a little bit. Um, I know that when I was playing – I had uh, trouble sleeping after matches, and we just talking to these guys is the same thing, you know. Some of them can't go to bed till two or three in the morning, and it's not because they don't want to. It's just the adrenaline of the match and everything that was going on is tough for them. And so we don't want to be taking, you know, we want to get home as early as possible, but we don't want to take up too much of their time to sleep. Um, being that we got to fly everything commercial and uh, in the U.S. Uh, I'd say another variable that we can't really control is flight delays, which people don't really consider. Uh, for example, we were just in uh, Las Vegas for preseason, and we had a flight scheduled for noon, get back at 1 o'clock, pretty straightforward, and we had a four-and-a-half-hour delay where mm. you're just sitting in the airport, can't do a whole lot. You know, Guys are probably a little sleep-deprived from a late game the night before, and uh, – you know, that's just something we can't control. But we have to take into account for the next session and the session after that, you know, how are we going to combat that? Um, do we need to change up the schedule at all with what's going on? And that's where we might jump in those uh, regen sessions to help the players out. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the last thing we'll look at is um, the, the hydration status of our players. And this is you know, 48 hours before match to 40 hours after a match, depending on where we're going. Uh, we just went to Colorado for uh, our second match of the season, and obviously that's an altitude, and hydration kind of plays a role. So we're doing um, urine density testing 24 hours to 48 hours before so we can kind of educate the guys. Hey, you're not hydrated. We need to kind of uh, attack this before we go. And so then we're supplementing guys with um, what we call them as hydrators, or uh, just uh, water by itself on the flights. And, you know, if you have a two, three-hour flight, making sure we're walking up and down the rows and uh, passing out packets or, or water, making sure that these guys are uh, getting all the help they can. I would say those are the biggest challenges that we face from flying across the U.S. Cool. No, that's really interesting. Um, just before – well, first, I'm conscious of time. So uh, I know you've had a busy day on the pitch so 
I just want to make sure everyone's aware of where they can keep in touch with with you and what you've got going on with Twitter, Facebook, email, whatever it may be. Yeah, sure. I think the best place to start out is probably on Twitter. My uh, handle is at Daniel P. Guzman, G-U-Z-M-A-N. Uh, I'm pretty active on there. I say Facebook could work as well, but uh, not so active on there. I got to do a bit of better job and then if people <laughs> want to talk more and, and email after that. We can exchange through uh, private messages, but cool. uh, I think Twitter is the best place. Awesome. Well, appreciate your uh, your insight, Dan. It's uh, It's been great to chat. Um, so me and you will keep in touch and, uh, and I'll speak to you soon. Cool. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks, mate. Speak to you soon. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode 78 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Dan. Just before I let you go, I want to say a massive thanks to the two sponsors today. Uh, the Nord Board, uh, brought, to you by Va- brought to you by Val Performance, and Train With Push, uh, makers of the Push Band. So we've got some great guests coming up over the next couple of weeks, coming from NHL, uh, NRL, coming from Premier League, um, and a couple of other great guests as well. So keep tuning into the podcast. Really appreciate your support. uh, And I'll speak to you in episode 79.